couldn't help when, uh, when he said we're not a perfect church, I, the Lord brought my attention right down the center aisle, and I looked right up that, through that glass door, and I saw Brother Adrian there. And I almost had a hallelujah moment. I think he's, he's right when he said not a perfect church. Grab your Bibles, turn to Second Chronicles chapter number 14. Pastor, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Very, very thrilled. Uh, loved listening to preaching. Um, I enjoy, certainly enjoy preaching. It's an opportunity to, uh, to serve the Lord with what he's called us to do, and we're grateful for it. I want to brag on our preacher just a little bit. Uh, what you just saw is, is authentic. It's real. Uh, what I'm saying is what you see behind the pulpit, we see it every day in the office, and we see it in our community. It's real. Um, when we had this uh, stroke, a lot of people talked about uh, stress, and is that the thing of it? I said, no. I, I mean, we, we don't have a stressful job here. Now, we have, we have expectations. Uh, there, there's there's a, a level of excellency that's expected every ministry that we oversee and things that we do. Uh, I mean, if, it, if it's worth doing for the Lord, it's worth doing right, right? It's, it's worth doing right. And, um, but I said, no, there's, there's, there's no pressure. There's, there's no, uh, there's no uh, big numbers. We're not always focused on the numbers. There's no pressure. There's no micromanaging. What you see is what you get with our pastor, and I think, I think that's... Uh, that's powerful. You don't find that everywhere. You just don't. And Pastor, we're glad to have you home. I uh, look forward to hearing you preach. And uh, would, would have been happy to sit there and listen to you uh, some, some more there. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter number 14. Uh, we're going we're gonna to work our way through uh, just these three chapters on, on, the, life of, on the life of Asa. And I've uh, got a couple things we'll, we'll talk about here towards, towards the end by way of making application. Um, I titled the message, The Blessings of Doing Good and Right in the Eyes of the Lord Our God. The blessings of doing good and right in the eyes of the Lord our God. And I want to carry this thought, can I have a perfect heart towards God? Can I have a perfect heart towards God? I, I believe we can. I believe the Bible shows us some things. I, I believe it will be encouragement. It's my desire tonight to, uh, you know, as, as pastors often talking about the Sunday night crowd. I remember when we first got here, you know, preachers are just like people. You know that, right? Uh, we're, some, some are persnickety, some, uh, some are fickle. You know, they're just, they're just like people. And uh, sometimes preachers will critique other preachers. And I remember calling my dad early on about, about coming to Cleveland Baptist Church. And I remember thinking this thought, well, no wonder the preaching's good. The music is amazing. I mean, anybody can get up and preach when you hear that kind of music. That makes it easy. Those guys, they're just coasting through it, right? Because we're grateful for the music ministry of Cleveland Baptist Church. We have folks that uh, labor, uh, folks that come in and practice and put time in. They, uh, in their spare time at home, they're practicing because they're using their talents and abilities to serve the Lord. And um, the other thing I remember, uh, you know, uh, calling my dad, talking to my dad about it. I said, Dad, they're preaching the same thing we do. They're preaching right down the line the same way we do. And that's a comfort. It really is. Pastor, we love you. We're so glad to have you, uh, have you back home. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter number 14. I, I want to work our way through the life of King Asa. I, I believe God gives us some things. Uh, it, 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 he really has an exciting life. He really, there's some things in his life uh, that are, can be a help to us and apply to us here in, in 2022. As a church family, our theme for this year is our eyes are upon thee. Uh, and that comes from Jehoshaphat's prayer in Second Chronicles chapter number 20. And I want you to think about this. While our eyes uh, should be, and they are upon the Lord, we better know this, that his eyes are upon us as well. Amen. His eyes are upon us. Amen. And we'll talk about that because th I, I believe, listen, I believe there's blessings of doing that which is good and right in the eyes of the Lord our God. Uh, so tonight we're going to look at the life of King Asa. I want you to notice here in Second Chronicles chapter number 14, uh, look with me in verse number 1 and verse number 2. The Bible says here, So Abijah uh, slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead, and uh, his days the land was quiet ten years. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Uh, I want you to notice as we get started here that he's off to a good start. He's born into a king's family, not just any king, but a king of David uh, from, the, from the tribe of Judah. He's, he's a direct descendant uh, from the bloodline of King David. And I got to thinking about that. Well, wait a minute. I think I, we, ha we have some similarities with Asa. Weren't we born into a great family? Weren't we born into a royal family the, the day we trusted Christ as our Savior? Romans chapter 8, uh, verse number 14 tells us, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, 
If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified to, together. You and I, the day we trusted Christ as our Savior, we were born into a king's family. We have a lot to be thankful for today. I think we can relate to this idea of being off to a pretty good start. He's born, uh, you and I today, if you're, you're here today as, as a citizen of the United States, we're, we live in a free country. We have the ability to serve the Lord. We have religious liberties. We have freedoms that we can enjoy. Uh, there's things that God has allowed us to do. Uh, God has given us a, a, a goodly heritage. We could, we could uh, relate with King, uh, King David. And when David penned the words in Psalm chapter 16, verse 5 and 7, The Lord is my, the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lions are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. He was born into a good family, but he was, excuse me, he was born into a, into a king's family, but his dad was a pretty good king. As we read through the, the, the books of uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Kings, we get this, this up and down of good kings, bad kings, good kings and bad kings. Well, his dad, Abijah, was a pretty good king. Look with me in chapter number 13 and look at verse number 4 and verse number 5. Uh, they have about 800,000 uh, from Jehoshaphat, this, the, the northern uh, ten tribes, uh, Israel. Uh, about 800,000 are coming up against Abijah and his, his group of about uh, 400,000. They're from Judah and Benjamin. Listen to what he says. And Abijah stood up upon, uh, upon Mount uh, Zemarim, uh, which is in the Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom of, over Israel to David forever, even to, to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? Go, go, look down to verse number uh, 10. He says, But as for the Lord, but as for us, the Lord is our God. And we have not forsaken him, and the priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait upon uh, their business. Uh, and they burn uh, unto the Lord every morning and every evening, burn sacrifices and sweet incense, and shoe bread also set they in order upon the pure table, and the candlestick of gold, and the lamps thereof to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but ye have forsaken him. And behold, God himself is with us for our captain." And his priests with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. O children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. Look down at verse number 18. Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. Now think about this. Ace is off to a pretty good start. He's born into a pretty good family. He's born into a king's family. And not just any king, a king from the, from the, uh, the tribe of Judah, from, from the, the bloodline of David. And, and he's, this is a good king. This is a king that's led the people to rely upon the Lord. He's had a pretty good example to follow. And I think you and I today, if we took inventory, we could look around this room. Even tonight, we could look around this room and we can see some faces that have been a tremendous blessing in our lives. We can see some people that have given us a good godly example to follow of faithfulness, of steadfastness, of just uh, unshakable faith. We can see that. Much like Asa, much like Asa, you and I sit here today, and we have been off to a pretty good start. But I want you to notice that this grew into his own personal faith. Now, this is important because we look at verse number 2 of, of chapter 14. He says here, And Asa did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, uh, that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. You see, it came, there came a point for Asa in his life when he looked around and he saw, hey, you know, I'm, I'm born into a pretty good family. Things are pretty good to be uh, the son of a king and, and to, to, to be able to hold on to this, this promise that we have for our family uh, through the bloodline of David. This is a pretty good thing. But at some point, he looked at uh, his daddy's faith and said, you know what, this just isn't enough. I need to now make it mine. I need to now personalize it. And young people, can I just challenge you today, as you look around the room, as you think, as you take inventory of the people that, that serve in, the, in this ministry, uh, whether it be uh, cleaning the, the, the building, uh, running the buses, uh, teaching your Sunday school classes, th there are, are dozens of people around here that have invested. They've laid a good example for you to follow. You look at your own parents. They've laid a good example to follow. At some point, listen, at some point, their faith has to become your faith. You have to lay claim on it and say, this is, I'm no longer uh, just walking in mom and dad's shadow. I'm now stepping out of my own. I'm making things my own. Uh, just, uh, just yesterday, we had an opportunity to 
takes Seth to look at a car, and, and uh, he's uh, looking for a vehicle to get uh, back and forth to work. And Lord willing, here in the fall, he'll take it down to Oklahoma. So it's got to be uh, somewhat reliable. Uh, I mean, we have, uh, we have AAA, so they can tow him, but, I mean, it's a 16-hour drive, so we want it to be pretty good. And um, so he had an opportunity to, to get it. We had the plates from the old car. I don't want to bore you with all the details, but uh, at some point, he could have just put the car, uh, could have put, put the car in my name, saved a few bucks on the, on the old license plate that we had from the old car. And he says, no, no, I want, I want it in my name. I'm, eight, I'm 18 now. I'm 18 now. Well, it's a good. It's your car. Put it in your name. I don't care. Good for you. Waste your money. Give it to the state of Ohio. I don't care. Right? <laughs> but there's just something about a man, 18 years old, a man, a young man stepping up saying, you know what, this is my responsibility. This is what I'm going to do. And there are, there, yes, we are going to trust our parents to, to guide us along the way and help us make some, some informed decisions along the way. But listen, at some point, we step up on our own two feet and we say, this is no longer just mom and dad's faith. This is now my faith. And Asa, Asa he demonstrates this. He demonstrates this, that this is his faith. I, I would just simply say to you, uh, I believe the desire of every godly mom and godly dad in this building tonight, and those watching online, uh, the desire of every parent in this place is that their children would walk with God and that their children would make decisions that are pleasing to the Lord. Are they ever going to be perfect? No, because they're your children. Of course they're not going to be perfect. But they can walk with God. Listen, I, 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 I don't subscribe to this idea, well, I just let them find their own path. No, no, I don't want them to find their own path. I want to lay a course that they can follow. I want to give them a pattern that they can say, you know what, mom and dad weren't perfect. Uh, they didn't always do everything just right, but there's something about that unshakable faith that they've demonstrated day in and day out, and I'm going to follow that pattern. No, 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 I don't want them to figure things out on their own. Eventually, at some point, their, 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 their faith has to become personal. I get all that, but listen, I want to set a good pattern for them to follow uh, so that they can walk with God the way God would have them to be. At some point, this, this faith that Asa has, it leads to action. I would submit to you that great faith leads to great action. Amen. Little faith leads to little action. No faith or dead faith leads to little or no action. Vain faith leads to, to vain actions. But I want you to notice how this good start leads, it leads him to some, some good decisions. I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to... Um, I believe for the last two, maybe three years, I, I've been asked uh, uh, to teach the, uh, the young men's leadership class there at Heritage Christian School. It's 10th grade young men, and we just have an opportunity to uh, work through a couple of books, talk about some things, some things I've learned uh, through, through my career, and uh, some things certainly that we've learned in ministry. And we talk about this idea of leadership, and the idea of leadership, the key word to think about is influence. It's influence. How, how, are, we, how are we influencing those? If I were... Um, if I were to take this balloon, and you recognize today, if I, if I, if I throw this balloon up, it's going to go a direction. And the idea of influence is that it's the ability to change the, tra the trajectory or the course of something or someone. So the balloon's going to come up. I'm going to push it over here. You know what I've done? I've used my influence to change the course. Some of you aren't awake yet. So it's coming down. I use my influence to change the course. That, that's leadership. And, and it's possible, listen, it's possible for good leadership and bad leadership. They're, they're both using influence. They're both using their, their influence, their leadership skills, to change the course of action of someone or something. And as Asa sits here, he says, you know what, I'm off to a pretty good start. He makes this faith personal. At some point, it starts leading to some good decisions along the way. I want you to notice these good decisions. Now look with me in chapter 14. Look at verse number 3. It says here, for he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. Uh, and he also put away uh, out of all the cities of Judah, the high places and the images and the kingdom was quiet before him. We're talking about today. Listen, we're talking about uh, the blessings of doing that which is good and right in the eyes of the Lord. He took away some things. He took away some strange gods. It's amazing. It's amazing how uh, strange gods, uh, these idols have a way of just creeping into their lives. And you and I, we can relate with that. We let our guard down in a certain area. It's like, well, wait, wait a minute, what, what just happened here? How, how did we get to this point? We, we've let our guard down. And he's, he, this, he's, he's leading to some good decisions. He's leading the children of Israel, uh, excuse me, the children of Judah to make some good decisions. They, they've took away the, the, uh, uh, the strange gods. They've taken away the high places. 
And again, it's amazing how these things uh, uh, come into our lives. I remind you today, as a New Testament Christian, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, that hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Amen. He doesn't just stop there. The Bible says he broke down some images. He, he, he cut down the, the groves. I want you to look at this. Hold your place here. Turn to Judges chapter number 3. And look with me in verse number 7. Judges chapter 3. And look with me in verse number 7. We recognize the time of Judges where uh, the children of Israel did that which was right in their own eyes. Judges chapter 3, verse number 7. Just a quick comment about these groves. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam in the groves. Now, in my Bible, I have a little note here about the groves. I just want to read this to you. Groves, like high places, have been associated with idolatrous worship from the time, from the beginning of time. The Hebrew, uh, Asherah, uh, translated grove, it means also the idol enshrined there. This idol uh, seems often to have been a sacred tree, the figure of which is constantly found on the Assyrian monuments. The children of Israel, are, uh, they, they build a habit of having these groves, of having these places where they can, uh, they can worship. And, and again, that, 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 that's from the influence of the world that came in. And Asa says, you know what? I have, God's given me a, a wonderful family to come from. I've, I've learned some things from my dad. It leads to some good decisions, and he gets rid of all these things. And you and I would celebrate it. We would say, good for you, Asa, that you've done this. This is a wonderful thing to do for your family. This is a wonderful thing to do uh, for uh, the children of Judah, and eventually here uh, uh, having a godly influence in the life of the, the children of Israel. But I want you to notice here the, the, the commandment that was given in Deuteronomy 16, 21. Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees uh, near upon the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. At some point, at some point, this had become the norm. High places had become the norm. At some point, uh, these groves had become the norm. At some point, these images had become the norm. It just became a part of life. Well, everybody's doing it. It's just, a, uh, just the norm. Well, when, when revival sets in, Asa says, hey, listen, we're, we're done with this. And no doubt, no doubt there would have been many that celebrated, many that said, thank God for a, a, a godly king that stands up and does right. And no doubt there's some that stood back and said, you know what, we kind of like those things. Those things were kind of convenient for us. I mean, the idea of having a high place means that you know, we can go and, and worship on our own. We don't have to really go to the temple to worship. We can kind of just kind of do it here. It's a little bit more convenient for us. So Asa gets rid of all these things. And again, uh, some probably rebelled against it. But I want you to know, he, he, also, he also makes some commands here. In verse number four, he says here, he commanded Judah to seek the Lord God their fathers and do the law and the commandment. And then notice his, his commandment, uh, singular, I, I believe he's referring to here, Deuteronomy chapter six, and thou, uh, verse five, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. You see, we're talking about the blessings of doing that which is good and right in the eyes of the Lord our God. And he says, you know what, uh, we, we're going to seek the Lord God of our fathers, we're going to do the commandment. Again, in verse number 7, therefore he said unto Judah, let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers, gates and bars, and while the land is yet before us. Because we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought him, and he hath given us rest on every side, so they built and prospered. There's the blessings. There's the blessings of faithfulness. They built and they prospered. They, they're, they're at peace, they, 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 they're, they're not at war. Uh, this this, this uh, uh, good start that led to some good decisions, and it also leads to a good strategy for battle. We, we could say it like this. We could say it like this. His good start helped him make good decisions that prepared him for the battle to come. His good start helped him make some good decisions that prepared him for the battle to come. You see, I, I don't know what kind of battles you're going to face this week, but you mark it down and you're going to face them. Uh, th those of you going to camp this week, you're going to, you're going to have some battles. Some may be, no, I'm, they're not going to be physical. But there, there's going to be some battles, some things that you're going to have to address. Some things that, that, God, that God's going to touch in your heart. 
There's some battles, and, and he's, he's prepared. He comes up with a pretty good strategy. I want you to look at this in verse number 8. And Asa had an army of men uh, that bear targets and spears. Out of Judah, 300,000. Out of Benjamin, uh, that bear shields. And drew bows, 200 and fourscore thousand. Uh, all these were mighty men of valor. He, you can see he's, he's building up an army here, verse number 9. And there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian uh, with an host of 1,000, 1,000. That's a million. And 300 chariots. 1.3 million chariots coming up against roughly a little over 500,000. And came unto Merisha. And Asa then went out against him. And they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephath at, uh, at Merath, Merisha. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. Pastor just talked about that a little while ago. For we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude, O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. I want you to notice, he's, he's telling me, listen, that's this idea of rest, it just means to, to, to support oneself. It means to, to lean or rely upon. These are, the army's equipped, it's ready to go, and it comes down to it, we're going to call out to God, and we're going to ask God, we're going to ask God to help us do right. And, and if we read the rest of it, you'll find that God gives him the victory. This is the blessings. There are blessings to enjoy, listen, there are blessings to enjoy when we do that which is good and right in the eyes of the Lord our God. And I want you to notice here, there's, there's a good response to the word of God from the man of God. Look at chapter 15. Chapter 15 in verse number one. The Bible says, And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and said unto him, Hear ye uh, me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel hath been without the, uh, the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel, and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of, our, of, our, of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Look at verse 7. Be strong, therefore, and let, uh, let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Notice the message that's preached. He says, listen, if, if ye will, then he will. I mean, things are going good in the kingdom. Asa is one of the good kings. He's doing a great job. He's doing that which was right. And the, that which is good and right in the eyes of the Lord. And God is blessing and God is uh, answering prayer. And God is responding in, in, a, in a very positive way. But notice the message that's preached to him. He says, listen, uh, he's with you while you are with him. And I was reminded of James chapter 4, verse number 6. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And then he goes on to say in, in, the, in that message, those seven verses we just read, seek him and you will find him. I couldn't help but think of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. The blessings. The blessings of doing that which is good and right in the eyes of the Lord. He goes on to say that in that same time, uh, same message there, those seven verses, if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And he closes out this, this statement. He says, look, just, just be strong and God will reward you for your labor. That's, that's a hallelujah moment. That's a good thing. There's blessings to doing that which is good and right in the eyes of the Lord our God. Asa takes courage of this. We see this in, in, in uh, look at uh, verse number uh, Verse number uh, eight here. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, the Bible says here, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all. Wait, didn't they already do this? Thought we already did that in the early part of the chapter, verse 14. Oh, it's, it's because of that rebellious crowd. Remember when they had this revival? Things are going good. Some are, are they're, they're, they're cheering him on. Way to go. And they're celebrating Asa. But there's always, there's always that, there's a holdouts. There's always a holdout. Say, so you know what? We'll see how long this lasts. Let's just hang on to some of these idols. 
And obviously he's aware of it because the Bible tells us in verse number 8 that he put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin, out of all the cities which he, which he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord and that was before the porch of the Lord. So he took courage and obeyed. He put away the altars, uh, excuse me, he put away the abominable idols, and he renewed the altar of the Lord. But I want you to notice this. That I came through this through my personal reading. Not everyone responds to the message of God in a positive way. Hold your place here in 2 Chronicles. We'll come back to it. But I want you to look with me in Ezra chapter number 6. Ezra chapter number 6. Actually, we'll look at verse number 5 uh, first. Book of Ezra, chapter number 5. We'll look at verse number 1. And then in chapter 6, we'll look at verse number 14. I want you to think about this idea that not everyone's going to respond in a favorable way to the preaching of the Word of God. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Then the prophets Haggai, uh, then the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido uh, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Now look at chapter 6, verse number 14. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and uh, according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. You understand what's happening here. There's, uh, they start to rebuild the temple, and there's some persecution, and they're dealing with this. And these letters are going back and forth. The work starts. The work stops. Well, Haggai and Zechariah, they come, and they, and, and they begin to preach. They begin to tell them, hey, thus saith the, Lord, the, the word of the Lord. And the Bible tells us that uh, the elders of the Jews, they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai. So then I began to ask myself, well, what was it? Uh, what, was it what does it mean to prosper? It just simply means to advance. It means having success, having favor. We're talking today about the blessings of doing good and right in the eyes of the Lord. And Asa, has, he has a prophet come to him, and he delivers this message, and, and he responds in a favorable way. And many times, you and I, we, we, have, prophets, we have preachers come to us, and, and, and our, we're going to be held accountable for how we respond to that. So I went back and I kind of just did a, uh, just a precursor read of, of Haggai and, and uh, Zechariah, what, you know, some main thoughts of what they preached on. Brother John Blankenship preached on, on, on Haggai, consider your ways. That was his message to them. And that helped them. It didn't hurt them, it helped them. It encouraged them along the way. And then we come to Zechariah. Zechariah, a common theme through Zechariah says, let your hands be strong, God is with you. Sometimes God will give us the, the message just what we need at the right time. And we understand tonight the importance of the man of God to preach the message that God has given. So I want you to think about Asa's response. We see in his response that he leads Judah in the same way that he's led his own personal life. He says, listen, this is what's going to happen. We're going, we're going to, to obey God. We're going to obey the, the preaching that was given. I want you to look at verse number 12. The Bible says, and they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. So there it is. There's, there's, there's the covenant. There, there's the response to the preaching of the word of God. There, there's, to make a covenant, it means to, to, to make a promise, to, to make a vow, uh, to, to, to hold to something. And the Bible says they did it with all their heart and with all their soul. Look at, uh, look at uh, uh, verse number 15. And Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with uh, their whole desire, and he was found of them. And the Lord gave them rest round about. There's the blessings of doing that which is good and right. They have rest. They have, no, they have peace. They have no war. There's something to be gained from them. There's something to be admired by this. He goes on to say in verse number, uh, verse number 18, but he brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and vessels. And there was no more war unto the, fifth, uh, unto the five and thirtieth uh, uh, year of the reign of Asa. This idea of, of a dedication, it just simply means, uh, it, it means it's, to, uh, it's a sacred thing. It's a sanctified thing. This offering that was brought, these, these, uh, these gold and silver, it was dedicated. It was set apart for God, for the use in God's, uh, in God's house. It's, it's, it's a great revival. 
It's a great time for the children of Judah. It's a great time for the children of Benjamin. Much has been said here, you know, much to be desired here about, about their lives, about the blessings of God upon their life. And as I stand here today, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, and as a Christian, as a believer, a member of Cleveland Baptist Church, I want God's blessings in my life. I'm not ashamed to say that. Oh, how I need them. If there's so, so many lessons we learned through this stroke thing, it, it's, w w one of the biggest things that we've, we've learned is just how truly helpless we are. Just how truly dependent we are upon the Lord. And I, God, I, I, I want God's blessings. And then I think from a corporate standpoint, I think about our church. And I think about the blessings that God has had on the Cleveland Baptist Church. And how I want, I, you know, if the Lord allows us, the Lord tarries his coming, and I have grandchildren one day, how I want them to be able to walk into Cleveland Baptist Church and see the same blessings of God, uh, God's hand upon this place. Because some people some, ma ma made some very similar decisions in the life of Asa. You know what? God's given me a, a pretty good start here. God, God's going to do some great things in my life, and I'm, I'm going to make some good decisions, and I'm going to be ready to go, and I'm going to have a good response to, to the man of God and how God preaches in my life. I'm just going to do my very best to be obedient in these things. They're enjoying the protection of God, the provisions of God, and the peace of God. And I would submit to you that those are still blessings that can be found today in the Christian life. Amen. It's what I desire. Well, we turn to the next chapter, chapter 16. There's a transition here. It changes. It changes. Well, I'll just tell you flat out, he doesn't, he doesn't end well. He doesn't end well. Look, look at chapter 16. Look with me in verse number one. Matter of fact, I, I considered even having a graphic come in and change my title to, instead of the blessings of doing good and right in the eyes of the Lord, how to lose the blessings of doing good and right in the eyes of the Lord. Look with me in verse, uh, verse number one. In the, six, in the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. Get this in your mind. They're, they're going to do an encampment. They're going to uh, you know, come against them. and They're going uh, to they're bring the battle. He knows it's coming. He's already been down this road before. I mean, I mean he, he saw it with his dad. His dad called out to the Lord, and he, they were able to get the victory. In his own life, he calls out to the Lord. He gets the victory there against the Ethiopians. Look at verse number two. Then Asa brought out silver and gold. Well, what's silver and gold? The silver and gold they had dedicated. To who? To the God of heaven. For the house of the Lord. He brought out the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, the uh, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between... A league? You know, a league is... Uh, 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 <clears throat> excuse me. Look up the definition of a league here. I have it somewhere in my notes, and it's just too hard to see it. I can't find it. There it is. There it is. I underlined it. It means, it means uh, that was a trick my dad gave me. So when you have a hard time, just underline something that will help your mind find it uh, as we're getting through this thing. But uh, a league is, it, it's a compact, it's a confederacy, it's a covenant. Amen. I, thought, I thought the last chapter they made a covenant with God. I thought they had dedicated these things to God. Now, in, in, in a moment of time, Asa now has switched. He's, he's taken these things that were set apart, these things that were holy, these things that were sanctified for God's use, and the, the consecrated things, and he's now taken them out, and he's, he's using them to, to, to build a covenant with, with, with this king of Syria. There's a league between me and thee, and as it was between my father and thy fathers, behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Ben-Hadad he uh, hearkened unto king Asa, and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and smote I, John, and Dan, and uh, Abilam, uh, Abilam, and uh, all the store uh, cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard it that he left off building of Ramah and left his works, left his works cease. And Asa the king took all, uh, took all Judah and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof there, wherewith Baasha was building and he built there with Geba and Mizpah. And at that time, uh, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, uh, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of, th out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge uh, host with very many chariots and horsemen? 1.3 million. Get that in your mind. 1.3 million chariots against roughly, five, I think, 540, 530 
And, they, and, they, and God gave them the victory over them. Thou didst, because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. And Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house. For he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the books, the book of the king, uh, kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers, and died in one and fortieth year of his reign. And they buried him in his own sepulchres, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed, which was filled with sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices, prepared by the apothecary's art. And they made a very great burning for him. He started what started well, and what could have and should have ended well, it doesn't end well. I want you to notice three things here, and we'll be done. Three things in, in Asa here at the end. Uh, number one, he gave away that which was not his to give away. He exchanged uh, uh, gold and silver for stones and timber. He took the things that were dedicated to the Lord, sanctified for the Lord, set apart for the Lord's work, and he traded them, and he hired Ben-Hadad. And what, what was the end result? Well, they left off building, and they, they, they recouped some wood and some timber. So we took, we took that which was right and holy, uh, the gold and silver, and he traded, uh, he traded it for stones and timber. He gave away that which was set apart. And I couldn't help but think about when, when our children were small, and how thankful we were uh, that God allowed us to have a family. And I can remember as, as a young dad uh, going into that room at nighttime when, when we had just one. And, uh, and just, just while he's sleeping, just praying over him. And God, just help him to walk with you. And then the second one came along. And we, I would, sometimes I would sneak in there. And sometimes I'd lay down on the floor. And I'd just, I'd just pray, God, please use them. Lord, they're, they're yours. Uh, Lord, help me be the dad that I need to be. And then, then the third one and the fourth one, they were all in one room. It was a small house. I kind of ran out of room on that floor. But that's still my desire today. Amen. Lord, they've been set apart. They're, they're, they're for your use. Do with, it, do with them what you will. God, if you want to call them away, if you call them to the other side of the planet, maybe you'll take us with them. I don't know. Whatever you want to do, God, we'll, they're yours. God forbid that I, that I would, that which was dedicated to God, that, that I would take them back. So why? So I can consume them? So I can hold on to them for me? So I can enjoy them? No, no. They've been set apart for the Lord. They've been dedicated to the Lord. I, I'm not going to give away that which is not mine to give away. They're the, they're the Lord's. Many a, many a Christian has, they've given away that which was not theirs to give away. They've given away their testimony. Their testimony is supposed to be a witness for the Lord. And they've exchanged it. They've given it away. So the first thing we see here, that the Asa gave away that which was not his to give away. The second thing here, he gave up on his covenant with the Lord. He makes a league. He makes a, a, a compact, a, a confederacy. He makes a covenant with the king of Syria. He relied on Ben-Hadad instead of relying upon God. He traded the eternal for the temporal. He looked out and he saw this, he saw this great, great, uh, great host. And he says, you know what, we, we, just, we just can't do it. We just can't do it. I'm, I'm, you know, we did it before, and for, for whatever reason, he, he forgot all of that, and he says, you know what, uh, uh, I can make a deal with Ben-Hadad. He gave up on his covenant with the Lord. He reacted by sight, not by faith. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. I want you to see this also, number three here. He gave in to anger, bitterness, and pride. Look at this. Look at his response. As the, as the man of God comes to him and confronts him, this would have been a perfect time for, for Asa to just, just, you know what? Just repent. Just ask for forgiveness. Lord, I've failed you here. I, I know that you've done this in the past. I, I know that you gave me a good start. I know that I've made some good decisions in the past. I, I, I know that this has led to some things in my life, and, and I have enjoyed the blessings of doing that which is good and right in the, in the eyes of you, God. Uh, Lord, I've made a mistake here. Forgive me. 
And I, I submit to you that God would have forgiven him, forgiven him. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He, 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 he gives in to anger. He gives in to bitterness and pride. He, the Bible says here that Asa, verse number 10, that Asa was wroth with his seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And he oppressed some of the people. He blamed the preacher. He oppressed the people. The Bible says here that he trusted in the physicians and said to the Lord. Look at verse number 12. Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. It, it kind of reminds us of this battle uh, with Baasha. Instead of, instead of seeking to the Lord, he sought to Ben-Hadad. Can, can I just make an observation here? Think about unconfessed sins in your life, and you mark it down, they will show up time and time again. Amen. Unconfessed sins in your life will begin to become a pattern in your life. It'll, 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 it'll become a behavior that, you're, that you've just grown comfortable with. Unconfessed sin, every unconfessed sin sets a new precedent in our life that we're bound to repeat. A, again, Asa should have repented, but instead he repeated his sin on his deathbed. But I don't, I don't want to end with a bad thought here. I don't want to end on a down, because I think a, there's an encouraging message here. I believe, I believe we can have a perfect heart before the Lord. I believe God shows us this. Uh, look with me in verse number, verse, number, uh, verse number nine. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout, throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Amen. This, uh, this word perfect, it means complete, uh, especially friendly, full, just, made ready. It means peaceable. The Noah Webster Dictionary defines it as complete in moral excellencies. And studying this out, the Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter number 28 that David had a desire for his son to have a perfect heart. In verse, uh, chapter 28, verse number 9, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou that the God, of the, uh, the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off. It was a perfect heart that Solomon requested for the children of Israel in, in, in the dedication of the temple. Solomon has a, this wonderful prayer in dedication of the temple, and then he gives a blessing to the children of Israel. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 59, let, And let these my words, wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord, be nigh unto the Lord our God. Uh, 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 excuse me. Verse number, uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 58. That he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. In uh, verse 59 here. And let these, these my words, wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord, be nigh unto the Lord our, our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and, cause, and the cause of his people at Israel at all times, as the matter shall be. David, uh, Solomon had desired that the children of Israel would have a, a perfect heart before the Lord. And he puts that responsibility completely on the Lord. So we have to, record, we have, we have to look today and, and we have to take account that God's desire for us is that we would have a perfect heart before the Lord. And he'll do that work. Psalm chapter 19, verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 73, verse 26, My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I don't know if you're in the habit of writing things down, but I, I, I want to jot this down. We're learning from those before us, and we're leaving a pattern for those behind us. In the life of Asa, he, he very clearly gives us an example of the blessings of God when we seek the Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul. When we do that which is good and right before the eyes of the Lord. And I believe today that you and I can't have a perfect heart. We just simply confess our sins. We simply ask God to give us that perfect heart. We don't do it in our own strength. And God does this thing. God does that work because it's, him, it's, it's his work to do in our heart. And I thought about this idea of searching. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, the privilege to go to, uh, to Myrtle Beach for our, our, our 20th wedding, uh, wedding anniversary uh, last year. And, um, you know, growing up in Central Illinois, I don't spend a lot of time on beaches. And that was my first time really spending a significant amount of time. And we saw tons of seashells. 
And we thought, you know what? Instead of spending you know, all these big dollars to buy a memento, we'll make our own. So we went to the store, bought these little jars for the girls. Now we're going to fill them up with seashells. And we spent a lot of time looking at seashells, a lot of broken ones. And I got this idea of God, uh, where it says here, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. I wanted to, I wanted to get a conch shell like this. I'll tell you about that in a second, and we'll finish up. I wanted to get a conch shell like this, and, and uh, by the time I get out to the beach, everybody else is already out there. And it's slim pickings. I mean, it's just not, not a whole lot of good shells. But I found out about 5 o'clock in the morning, there's not a lot of people on the beach. So I started getting up early, and I started going on the beach first thing in the morning. And I'd find some pretty good pieces, and I found... This was, um, after about four days there, this is the best one I could find. There's nothing really a whole lot about it. It's, it's not perfect. It, the, tip, the tip is broken off. There's not really nothing spectacular about it. It's kind of dull looking. I think that's because of the time of the year. Maybe it has something to do with it. I don't know. But this is the best one I could find. And I, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. I mean, I'm embarrassed. And the pastor just said we'd go on vacation. I spent hours, hours out there. It was great. It really was. We had a blast. We didn't have to worry about anything. We just had fun. Just to, and we spent a lot of time together, just the two of us, walking them down, trying to find shells. I mean, I couldn't believe how many hours we spent. Hours. And this is all we got. And I think about God, searching to and fro throughout the whole earth, trying to find those whose heart is perfect towards him. This one, as you can see, is much better looking. This one I got back in 2009. We were down at Pensacola Beach, and uh, right there, at the, there's a pier that goes out in the water, and the girls were small, and this guy was, he was alive at the time. He was down under the water, and... Uh, like, my, my, the girl said, you know, I think it was Savannah, she says, Dad, can you get that shell? Well, I'm not much of a swimmer. I wasn't really thinking about it. It wasn't anybody else. It was March. It wasn't anybody in the water. And I uh, knew they were doing some construction. It, it was about maybe 60 yards off the, off the shore or along that pier. And I went and got one of those two-by-fours. And I kid you not, I shimmied this thing all the way up to the shore. Why? Because my daughter asked me to get it. I mean, she asked me for money. I can't give her money, but I can give her a shell. There was a, there was a little guy living in there. I, don't, go, don't get mad at me, but we had to get him out of there. <laughs> I buried that thing in the ground. And, uh, and when we got home, a bunch of bugs would eat out all that stuff out of there. And then we, we shined it up. And then I thought, you know, what's the difference between these two? Well, this one's, this one's perfect. And there's not a flaw in it. It's not, it's not broken, it's whole. See, because this started, it was alive when I found it. The Bible tells us that we're to be a living sacrifice to the Lord. God, I want to have a perfect heart towards you. This, this was the result of really the leftovers, to be honest with you. Just kind of run up on shore. It had been beaten in the, in the, in the ocean for quite a while. I mean, it's, it's a tough dude. I mean, look at him, he's... He's pretty bad. He's got some scars and some holes. And, but I kept it because it, it was the best one that I found on that trip. But what about you? Are you willing to be a living sacrifice to the Lord? Because the Bible, I, I, listen, I believe with all of my heart the blessings of doing that which is good and right behind the eyes of the Lord, God has them for us. He has a desire that we would do that. And I just wonder tonight, I wonder tonight if you're here and maybe, maybe you've given up that which you should not have given up. You've exchanged. You've made a covenant with God, and you've, you've gone back on that covenant. And things just aren't like the way they used to be. Maybe, maybe today tonight would be a good time to, to recommit to the Lord. A, tonight would be a good night to say, you know, God, I look back in my life these past few months, weeks, years, and I've exchanged that which I shouldn't have. I've given away that which I shouldn't have. I've, I've given up. I've given up on, on, some, uh, on some promises that I've made to you. And, I, and to be quite honest, I've given in to anger and bitterness and pride in my life. And God, I, here's, the, here's the prayer tonight. I want to finish well. We learn a lot from Asa, don't we? He had a wonderful uh, kingdom. He had a wonderful life. He just didn't finish well. How we need, how we need God's help to keep, our, to keep our, our heart perfect towards him, to keep our heart where it ought to be so that we can enjoy the blessings of doing good and right before the eyes of the Lord. Would you stand?